Several months ago, I became interested in the neutral powers of World War II, and then I made three videos, one on Portugal, another on Turkey, and yet another on Switzerland, and I discussed how these neutral powers navigated their way through World War II. I had always intended to do Ireland and Sweden, but life intervened, and instead of finishing those videos in early July as I had intended, I had to do other stuff. Well, I finally decided it's time to get that done, so without any further ado, let's talk about Ireland and World War II. The Who Are We Neutral Against line on this slide is Ireland's mock war cry. I'm sure the joke speaks for itself. On the left, we see what the Irish countryside looked like during World War II. You can see on the coast there that they wrote out the word IRE, the Gaelic word for Ireland. And that is to show potential German airmen flying over who had bombs in their bomb bays that this was not a place to bomb. This isn't England and you're not at war with us. However, as you see on the right, that wasn't always successful and Ireland did receive a few bombs, but for the most part they were mostly unscathed. So why did Ireland remain neutral? What was Ireland's role in World War II despite its neutrality? And what is the legacy of that neutrality? I plan on exploring all of those topics right now. If you really want to understand why Ireland remained neutral during World War II, then you have to understand that they weren't sympathetic to the Nazis, so they had no reason to join the Axis powers, and they also had no love lost for Britain. Ireland and Britain had been at odds for many centuries, from the 12th century Norman invasion to the invasion of Oliver Cromwell to a million conflicts in between. Ireland had plenty of grievances against Britain. Um, the Easter Rising in 1916 began the process for Irish independence. The British formally recognized Irish independence of the Irish Free State in 1922. However, um, this independence did not include the northern areas of Ireland, which have been heavily settled by Protestants. That remains somewhat of a bone of contention to this day, although there hasn't really been a lot of violence in recent years, thankfully. Um, now, this Anglo-Irish Treaty, which established Irish independence, became a real bone of contention. There was a faction within Ireland which felt that this treaty was far too... Um, accepting of British rule in the north and also Brit British uh, sort of hegemony in general. So there was a civil war, but the sort of mainstream faction ended up winning out, the faction that held the government and had signed the treaty. Um, and even after that, though, this the fact that there had been a civil war did show that the Irish public at large was mostly now concerned with upholding the sovereignty of Ireland and trying not to just be another puppet of Britain. So they were, if you really wanted to be a successful Irish politician, one thing that you could do is defy Britain openly and publicly and show that Ireland um, really was charting its own course. So needless to say, the average Irish citizen at this time was very anti-British and if you had any chance of winning an election, you needed to be equally anti-British, at least rhetorically. So let's look at who was leading Ireland during this time. Eamon de Valera was Ireland's president for the entirety of World War II. He was born in 1882 in New York to a Spanish father and an Irish mother, and he later moved to Ireland. He was active during the Easter Rising, and then during the Irish Civil War of 1922 and 23, he actually sided with the faction that said that Ireland had given up too much in the Anglo-Irish Treaty. He became president in 1937, and he would remain president until 1948. I believe he had another tenure as president after this, but I might be mistaken in that. I don't really care what he did after World War II. That's not what this video is about. Um, his, one of his crowning achievements in Ireland is as the father of the Constitution of Ireland in 1937. He was a fairly savvy politician. He was able to hang on the power for 11 years, and he made some pretty controversial decisions, as you might imagine would be the case for someone who was on the losing side of a civil war just a decade before he became president, and then guided his country through arguably the greatest conflict in human history. 
Um, religiously, he is still controversial. I've seen material online that says he was an ardent Catholic and was not very tolerant of others. I've seen other material that says that he gave a lot of lip service to the Catholics, but actually protected freedom of religion. Let's go with that. Um, I might be wrong on that, however. I am neither Irish nor an expert on Irish politics. But so far as I can gather, um, this guy who still elicits controversy did uphold religious freedom even if he had some personal reservations due to his own strict Catholicism. Obviously, in the context of Irish neutrality during World War II, we're focused on de Valera's foreign policy and not his domestic policy. So what was his foreign policy? Well, just like his country as a whole, de Valera really wanted to establish that Ireland was sovereign in its foreign affairs in terms of who it would be at peace with, who it would be at war with, who it would trade with, all that good stuff. So one of his most impressive accomplishments was during the Spanish Civil War from 1936-1939, where the Irish public actually wanted to side with Francisco Franco and his fascist nationalist because Franco was a devout Catholic. However, de Valera recognized that fascism was dangerous and he managed to stay out of the conflict without losing his office. So, pretty deftly handled. He also stopped neutrality from being enshrined in the Irish Constitution when he helped to form the Irish Constitution in 1937. Now, there was a lot of pressure for Ireland to remain a permanent neutral, and the public as a whole was against being involved in any kind of foreign conflict at that time. Um, however, he kept that out of the Constitution precisely because he knew that Ireland's leaders would need some flexibility and negotiating power when dealing with foreign powers in order to make Ireland relevant and useful on the international scene. And in addition, in the context of the 1930s and going into the 40s, de Valera was never under any illusion and he always understood that the greatest threat of the era was Adolf Hitler and not Britain or some other enemy or potential enemy. Since the Anglo-Irish Treaty had mandated that Ireland would still be within the Dominion of Britain, you can imagine that the default position of any British Prime Minister is that Ireland should not have an independent foreign policy, and Neville Chamberlain was no exception to that rule. Despite his reputation for appeasement, he had no intention of appeasing the Irish early on. But then, after 1937, as Hitler began uh, showing his aggressive side and annexing different areas on his, around his borders, Chamberlain began to really think of what would happen if he and his country were to be plunged into an all-out war with Hitler. So he decided that it's actually more important to have Ireland remain neutral or be friendly than it is to uphold British prerogatives and, you know, risk Irish hostility. So he basically tells them that they can pursue whatever foreign policy they want with kind of a strong hint that it needed to not be pro-German. And in the event, this would not prove to be an issue since de Valera had no intention of siding with Hitler ever. Um, what ends up happening is that Chamberlain will cede the Irish ports. There are three or four ports in the south of Ireland that were supposed to be under the British Navy according to the treaty, but Neville Chamberlain allowed the Irish to control those ports. And partly this is caused by a study the year before by the British Navy which showed that these ports really didn't have a lot of strategic value and they also probably didn't have the most up-to-date facilities, so they wouldn't have really been terribly useful anyway. So it was a fairly small sacrifice, but in the eyes of Ireland, this was a major foreign policy victory, and it really did show that de Valera was making Ireland strong and independent. Famously, on September 1st, 1939, the Germans invaded Poland, and World War II in Europe began in earnest. On September 12th, Ireland decided to declare neutrality, and de Valera told the British not to send over any ships, submarines, or aircraft, and also informed the Germans that the Irish had every intention of staying out of this conflict. Now, 
Winston Churchill was absolutely infuriated. He was now prime minister. And he never forgave the Irish. Even years after the war was over, he would continue to accuse the Irish of cowardice for remaining neutral during the war. However, that does raise the question, was Ireland actually completely neutral, or did they favor one side over the other? The reality of politics is that to get anything accomplished, you have to remain in power, and sometimes that means using rhetoric that you personally don't really agree with. In the case of De Valera, he very clearly had two distinct policies, one for public consumption and then his actual policy. Now, in public, because he was elected on the platform of being anti-British by a public which was entirely anti-British, he said that he would resist the British if they ever invaded, and he warned them repeatedly not to invade or impinge upon Irish independence. However, in private, de Valera and the various Irish officials would meet with the British and discuss a mutual defense of Ireland in the event of an invasion by Germany. Um, G2, which is the Irish military intelligence, and MI5 corresponded pretty closely and shared quite a bit of information. G2 did provide a few um, snippets of information that they would gather from you know, the German embassy in Dublin, no doubt. Um, at the same time, Ireland kept the IRA in check, and they also would um, make sure that when Allied airmen would crash over Ireland or in Irish waters, that these airmen would be returned to either Britain or the United States on the dubious claim that they were clearly only flying a training mission and not a combat mission. So that was, um, you know, some a way around that. That's something that Switzerland didn't do, for instance. We saw in our video on Switzerland that uh, the Swiss detained Allied airmen. Obviously, it was a lot harder for the Swiss to return airmen than it would be for Ireland. Um, and despite the fact that, uh, um, you know, the Irish Free State had some real resentment and hostility towards Northern Ireland, they did send firefighters to Belfast when the Germans launched a bombing raid on that city. So they did do some things to help the Allies, and they weren't super subtle about it compared with some of the um, neutrality that we've seen out of Switzerland and Turkey. There is something called Plan W. This was part of this cooperation between British and Irish officials. And basically what this was is that in the event that Ireland were to be invaded, the British forces stationed in Northern Ireland would hurry south and then combine with the Irish to try to form a defensive line and ultimately set the stage for driving the Germans back into the sea. And despite the fact that Churchill was always um, an opponent of the Irish and really chastised them for their conduct during the war, there was an official report called the Cranbourne Report where the British listed 14 different ways that the Irish had helped Britain and w winning the war and you know had really pointed out that Ireland did about all that it could without actually joining the war effort. At the outset of this video I mentioned that Ireland tried its best to avoid German bombings and for the most part they were successful but there was one major exception now, probably on their way to hit Belfast, some German bombers flew over Dublin and ended up dropping some bombs. And this occurred on May 31st, 1941. These bombings resulted in the death of 27 people, 45 more were injured, and then about 325 homes were either destroyed or heavily damaged. Now, obviously, the Irish were not happy about this, and de Valera launched a formal protest with the German embassy, but Hitler didn't respond. And if you're surprised by the fact that Hitler didn't respond, keep in mind that Hitler and the people around him were bad enough at diplomacy that Brazil entered the war and sent thousands of men to fight in Italy. Um, that's diplomatic incompetence of the highest order. I have no idea how he angered Brazil that much, and I'd really actually like to know. I might do a future video on that, but... Uh, yeah, German uh, diplomacy in World War II was about as bad as it could possibly be. One recurring theme that we're going to see over and over is that Winston Churchill hated the Irish and suspected them of colluding with the Germans. One of his 
specific assumptions was that Ireland was harboring U-boats. And the reason he suspected that is because de Valera refused to hand back over the treaty ports that Neville Chamberlain had granted to Ireland. So that was really all Churchill had to go on. And obviously that's some pretty thin evidence. Now, to be fair to Churchill, he was under a lot of pressure and you know the war in the Atlantic was pretty fierce. British shipping was getting hammered by U-boats. However, you know, resorting to one of his personal prejudices as an explanation for a problem that clearly had other causes is pretty stupid. Now, in February 1944, apparently because he didn't have bigger problems, Churchill actually called for the isolation of Ireland, meaning that he wanted to impose a sort of economic blockade and not trade with the Irish. Now, um, he did this, and it had a little bit of an impact, but it really wasn't all that bad, um, all things considered. And it looks like de Valera did what he could to keep this sort of under wraps. Also keep in mind, as we'll see later, that um, there were Irishmen serving on their own accord in the British and Allied forces. So because there were about 60,000 men in the British Army and then another 100,000 or so people of Irish origin working in British factories, Churchill had to be somewhat careful because he didn't want to alienate these people. Now, obviously, he could take a stand against Ireland to some extent since the people serving in the British Army clearly agreed to some extent with um, his anti-Irish propaganda and they thought Ireland was wrong. But there's only so far he could go without risking alienating people who were contributing to his cause. If you'll recall what we saw in some of our previous explorations of World War II neutrals, Churchill did not respect neutrality, one, and two, he did everything in his power to make sure that the Americans shared his view. So, by 1942, the Allies could look at the situation in the Atlantic and see that the combination of American um, cargo ships and warships would ultimately prevail over the German U-boat threat. So Ireland and those treaty ports became less and less important, and therefore there was not nearly as much reason to try to appease the Irish any more than you had to, especially since it was by this point clear that the Irish had no intention of siding with the Germans at any point, despite what Churchill had thought earlier. Now, um, in general, the U.S. was more favorable to Ireland in their contributions than the British were, Obviously, the British had a history with the Irish, whereas the U.S. actually had a large Irish population, so there's quite a difference in perspective there. Um, there actually was one incident where Foreign Minister Aiken visited Washington and actually got into a shouting match with FDR because Ireland was not sufficiently supporting Britain and the views of FDR, but of course Aiken most likely gave him a lecture on um, you know the need for Irish sovereignty and... Uh, the history of British oppression, but FDR was more focused on winning the war. And you can imagine that two people could have the best of intentions, but still, you know, almost come to blows over something like that because of how deeply each of them felt about his own position. There was also the American ambassador to Ireland, uh, Ambassador Gray, who shared Churchill's view and did things to try to undermine Irish neutrality. Now, Aiken, the foreign minister of Ireland, was a bit of a firebrand, and he went around the U.S. visiting Irish communities and talking about how the British had treated Ireland like garbage for years and, you know, basically explained why Ireland chose to stay out of the war. Now, obviously, as you might imagine, the people who were trying to push the war effort and promote patriotism in America, as well as in Britain, looked at Aiken's tour as pro-German propaganda and really tried to smear him and the government he represented for that. Now, Churchill eventually kind of won over FDR and they agreed to not trade wheat, fuel, and fertilizer for Ireland's products of beef and beer, despite the fact that Allied service member enjoyed those things. Part of the reason FDR eventually signed on was not so much hatred of Ireland as that, you know, these products were valuable and he could get more for them elsewhere. Now, um, Churchill never publicly came out and said that he had figured out a way to screw over Ireland, 
So De Valera never said that Churchill was in any way responsible. And, you know, he just said, well, you know, it's like this in war. Sometimes there's shortages. We'll be okay. So there was tension, but it was never of the um, we're about to go to war variety. It was more of the we have an opposing view of the world and there's only so far we're willing to go in terms of working together kind of tension. The tension between Ireland and the Allies reached its peak in February of 1944 when the Allies issued an ultimatum to expel Axis representatives from Ireland. Now, this was a weird ultimatum to issue since the Allies had no intention of fighting Ireland, and normally if you issue an ultimatum, there has to be some sort of penalty attached, but it was kind of an empty ultimatum. And because Churchill was dependent on a lot of Irish servicemen, as I noted earlier, de Valera decided that he was going to hoist Churchill by his petards and really hammer him. Now, obviously, I say Churchill because it's pretty easy to figure out who was the driving force of this ultimatum. Um, so what de Valera did is he refused point blank, and then he mobilized his army. We'll talk about what the Irish mobilization uh, was like during the war, but they already had half their army facing the British anyway. So basically, de Valera said that Britain would resist any attempt by the Allies to take over the country. And this was massively embarrassing to both the U.S. and the U.K., so they issued an apology because they had no intention of fighting Ireland. And despite some reservations about Irish neutrality, they wanted to keep Ireland more or less on their good side. The other thing that was really stupid about this ultimatum is that there was really no reason to want the Allied embassy, or the Axis embassies gone, since uh, G2 was actually a very effective service and the Axis Embassy was not able to sow any dissent among the populace and posed no danger whatsoever. So this altogether was yet another example of Winston Churchill acting on prejudice and not being nearly as capable as a leader as he is often made out to be in many of his biographies. Behind closed doors, Eamon de Valera did all that he could to help the Allied cause without actually going to war. However, he actually held on to the neutral stance longer than most other neutral powers and arguably quite a bit longer than he had to given how far the German threat receded by 1944. So one of the ways that he tried to appear neutral was even as late as 1945 when both FDR and Hitler died. He visited the U.S. Embassy and the German Embassy, respectively, to express his condolences for the deaths of these two leaders. Now, when Hitler died, it was revealed that the Holocaust had occurred within a few days. So the fact that de Valera had issued a statement offering his condolences to the German people for the death of Hitler caused public outrage in Ireland, and people were pretty miffed at him, and he was in a lot of hot water. And then, a few days later, Winston Churchill once again bailed out de Valera. So he came in and he gave a victory speech, and one of the little things that he threw into the victory speech is basically that Ireland contributed nothing, and they were cowards, or at least that's how the Irish public read that. So that sets up de Valera to then justify his policy to his public, and he talked about all the blood they didn't shed, and how, you know, Britain wouldn't have been grateful anyway, as seen in what Churchill said. And the hour of Britain's greatest triumph, you know, the ultimate triumph over evil, he couldn't help himself but to then slam Ireland for basically no reason. So because of Churchill's ineptitude yet again on the Irish issue, de Valera was able to save himself after committing the ultimate faux pas. And of course, he retained his popularity, and the Irish public, probably till this day, still regards what de Valera did as the right course for Ireland. So, let's look at life in wartime Ireland. One major shortage that they did have was a shortage of coal, which you needed to stay warm during the winter. And one way that the Irish made good on that shortage was to fetch peat from the bogs near Dublin. However, peat is harder to dry. It's basically just coal, which hasn't fully developed. 
and this was not all that effective as a heating tool and I have to imagine that quite a few Irish had to go cold during the winters of the war years. Now overall though there weren't very many shortages and the average Irishman during this time would have had a better quality of life than citizens in Britain including the um, British who lived in Northern Ireland. One thing that we see as um, common even in neutral powers is that there was strict censorship. Um, one aspect of the censorship was that you could not make jokes about the weather because the thought was that if you joke about the weather then that would tell the Germans or in the public eyes the British about what the weather was like and that could enable an invasion if you said like the weather's clear today. You also were not allowed to post obituaries about Irish soldiers who died in British service because that would show partiality to Britain and if your official policy is that you're neutral then that would seem out of touch with your neutrality. De Valera had an Emergency Powers Act which basically gave him a lot more authority than any president before him and the ones after him as well. Wages were frozen so we were looking at a bit of a command economy during the um, war years and because pigeons were often used to transmit messages um, by spies the ownership of pigeons was tightly restricted so you know that seems like something you probably want to think about but uh, that was one of the major steps the government took to try to limit espionage so I guess it was not a great time if you were a pigeon enthusiast but everybody else mostly did okay. So let's take a general look at how the Irish government was structured during the war and also what they did with the military resources that they had at their disposal. So after the passage of the Emergency Powers Act there were two government departments. One of them was basically in charge of all the domestic affairs and their main priority, really only priority, was just keeping the population fed they did that pretty well. Obviously, most people didn't go hungry during the war. And the other department was for defense and foreign policy. So, you know, pretty even and neat division. Now, the army was also divided into two parts. One half of the army was facing Northern Ireland in case there was an overland British invasion. Clearly, this was to appease public opinion. No serious Irish leaders thought that this was going to happen. And the other half of the army was in the south in case the Germans decided to launch an invasion. This was more likely. However, there is little to no evidence that the Germans ever even contemplated a seaborne invasion of Ireland. They had bigger fish to fry, and if they had invaded one of the British Isles, it would have clearly been Britain and not Ireland. You may have been able to tell from my tone earlier that I think that the insistence of Winston Churchill and other allied leaders that Ireland cast aside its neutrality and join the war was stupid. And the reason why I think it was stupid is because even if Ireland had joined the war, it's almost impossible to imagine a scenario where the participation of the Irish military would have actually made any kind of meaningful difference on the course of the war look at how Ireland was in the 1940s. It has a small population. There's only three million people. There are only so many people you can contribute to a war where armies number in the millions. Of that three million, how many were able-bodied men of military age? Not all that many. And we know 60,000 of them did serve despite the fact that Ireland stayed out of the war. Would an extra, I don't know, 100,000 men have really decided the outcome of the war. If you look at the scale of the battles on the Eastern Front, I have to laugh at the assertion that that extra influx of manpower would have made a major difference. Ireland had very limited industry. Um, they really didn't have the ability to manufacture war materials. Um, they also have no natural resources like uh, you know, Wolfram that Portugal could produce. Ireland is a new nation. They don't really have a military tradition in the same way that England had one or that America had one or that even Canada had one. And because the only military experience the Irish had was in fighting the Easter Rising and then fighting the Irish Civil War, 
They had no commanders who were experienced in commanding large-scale warfare. So none of their commanders had ever really held a command which made them think on a strategic level or operate with complex logistics or operate abroad. So any contribution the Irish would have made to a war would have had to have been by providing men to the meat grinder under the command of foreign generals. Um, They really had no officer corps. There was really no way they were going to be able to, you know, manufacture one that was effective out of thin air. So there's not really much Ireland was going to contribute. And anyone who thinks that, um, you know, Irish Ireland staying neutral was actually some great disservice to the Allies really just isn't being very smart about this at all. In all of my other videos on the military capabilities of neutral powers, I was able to divide their air and naval capabilities into two different slides. Here I see no point in doing that. So at the outbreak of the war, Ireland had literally no navy. There was not a single ship that was registered as a naval vessel of the Free State of Ireland. Um, Later in the war, the U.S. and Britain supplied six torpedo boats, a few fighters, and a few anti-aircraft guns. So effectively, Ireland still had no navy. Um, And then uh, until 1943, the most advanced fighter in Irish service was the Gloucester Gladiator, a biplane. Admittedly an advanced biplane from the 1930s, but still a plane that was far too slow to have any real chance against a Messerschmitt 109 or a Focke-Wulf 190. And they only had three of them. So, uh, yeah, that was not going to work very well. So now let's take a look at the Irish Army during World War II. So, prior to the emergency, which is what the Irish called the war, um, there were only 6,000 poorly armed men in the army. It's only 6,000 men who are considered professional soldiers. Um, During September of 1939, as it became clear that, you know, Ireland might be in trouble at some point, 20,000 men were mobilized. However, they couldn't be armed because Ireland simply didn't have the weaponry on hand and also lacked the industrial capacity to produce it. Now, Britain during this period Um, you know, was struggling to arm its own troops, so they weren't going to provide any arms. So ultimately, the U.S. was the arms supplier for the Irish, and they shipped over 20,000 rifles for this new army. Um, By April and May of 1941, when, um, you know, Britain was still fighting for its life against the Germans, and the U.S. hadn't entered the war yet, this is sort of one of the low ebbs of the Allied war effort, There was a standing army that peaked in Ireland at 41,000 men. After that, they began to move away from focusing on a standing permanent professional army and focused on the local defense force, which is more or less their National Guard or militia. And that peaked in June 1943 at 106,000 men. One of the things that the Irish did during this period to keep their country safe is they would have militiamen patrolling the highways and checking papers to make sure that people who were uh, who they said they were were obeying curfews and whatnot. Um, and because these militias early on were not properly provided with arms, they were actually just carrying around shotguns and whatever other weapons they could scrounge together. If you were inclined to bet how many motorized vehicles would you expect Ireland to have given that they only had three aircraft and zero ships going into World War II? Well, they didn't have very many, and the ones that they had were kind of garbage. Um, so they you know, don't really have a lot to work with in terms of modern military equipment at any level. They do have some 20-year-old armored cars of World War I um, extraction, but you know those aren't really going to be much use in World War II. Um, motorized technology had advanced quite a bit by the Second World War. Now, the Irish did need to patrol faster than foot speed, so they actually put out men on motorcycles and bikes, and those men earned the nickname of the Piddling Panzers, which 
something I'm kind of fond of. I like that label quite a bit. I find that amusing. Um, they also did make some new armored cars on their own initiative, and what they did was they actually found some armor plating left over by the British Navy in those treaty ports, and they took the plating that was supposed to be put onto you know destroyers and battleships and whatnot, and then used that on the chassis that they were able to find at a Ford plant. And then they made their own armored car pictured on the right. And if I'm not mistaken, that armored car actually remained in Irish service until the 1960s. So it was a design that they were fairly fond of. The biggest gray area of Irish neutrality is how the government acted towards the people who decided to go serve in the British Army. Um, so officially, Ireland basically just ignored the fact that this was going on. Irish officials didn't do anything to really discourage civilians from going to Britain to serve, and if someone wanted to desert the Irish army to go join the British army, uh, they just kind of acted like it never happened. Um, it looks like up to 200,000 people left Ireland to serve in some capacity or other during the course of the war, and that's a pretty high percentage if you think about the fact that Ireland only had 3 million people. And as I mentioned earlier, had Ireland actually entered the war, they might not have been able to field that many more men than that anyway. And, uh, you know, it's unlikely that they would have been able to form very big all-Irish units anyway. So it wouldn't have made much difference. Now, uh, of the men who did go ultimately to serve in the British forces, four to 7,000 of them were deserters from the Irish military. And Ireland lost 10,000 people in British service. Now, so far as I can tell, and I haven't done a lot of research on this, but the continuing controversy among Irish people about World War II neutrality is that a lot of Irish people feel like the veterans who fought and died on the Allied for the Allied cause did not receive sufficient gratitude from the government and the public as a whole. Um, so finally in 2013, the Irish deserters who had left the army to go fight in Britain, or for the British, excuse me, were officially pardoned. Um, now before that, I don't think that their service had ever really been acknowledged, at least that's my understanding. And, um, you know, that was a bone of contention. But again, correct me if I'm wrong on that, I'm not super up to date on my Irish politics. So now the question that we've all been waiting for, was Irish neutrality the moral thing to do or should they have gotten involved in the war? Now we've already talked about the people who think that Ireland should have gotten involved, Churchill and his acolytes, um, who at this point probably include most of the British, at least on this particular issue. Now um, one of the marks against the Irish during this period is that they were pretty indifferent to the suffering of Jewish refugees and they had no real interest in letting them in. That seems to stem from a fear of job loss. Um, obviously Ireland was not a rich country and they didn't feel like they had a lot to offer and they didn't want their own quality of life to suffer um, in order to help people in need from who were not a member of their community. Now, as we discussed earlier, Ireland was super Catholic during this time period to the point that they saw Francisco Franco as a good guy, which is, uh, you know, more Catholic than you can be and still see the value in helping Jewish refugees, most likely. Um, so, Ireland was actually punished for their neutrality, so the major powers of the world actually did judge Ireland as immoral for staying neutral by excluding them for 10 years from the UN, but then in 1955 they were finally admitted. Um, however, I would argue that de Valera made both the smart and the moral decision. Now, he was leading a democracy, and the people of Ireland, by and large, with the exception of the people who volunteered for the war, had no interest in fighting on behalf of an oppressor who had been screwing them over for centuries. Um, if de Valera had gotten Ireland engaged in a war, that would have been anti-democratic, and it also would have really screwed them over. They were militarily unprepared to fight this war. Not only that, but almost certainly de Valera would have been removed from office and replaced with somebody else who might have made a peace agreement 
And if Ireland had entered the war and then dropped out of it, then that would have done a lot of harm to both the prestige of Ireland and the prestige of the Allied cause. Now, of course, we're talking hypotheticals, but I'm just going through some things that could have happened. And furthermore, Ireland was never directly attacked or even really threatened by the Axis powers, so it didn't really have an obligation to enter the war. Um, again, if you can, if you look at their recent history, and also the fact that they were not directly attacked, there's not really any compelling reason to make the argument that Ireland needed to be involved in the war. I'm sure plenty of you will disagree with my assessment. And that's okay, that's what the comment section is for. Next time we resume the series, we'll be talking about Sweden's role during World War II, and then the series will officially be over.